In today's gospel, we hear the story of Doubting Thomas. Oh yeah, please sit down. My bad. Don't stand for nine minutes and 22 seconds. That's not a good idea. In today's gospel, we hear the story of Doubting Thomas, the man who for 2,000 years has been known not for the years he followed Jesus or the good things he has done, but for the one moment that he doubted. But what if Thomas wasn't doubting Thomas? What if he was grieving Thomas? I wonder how many of us here have lost a loved one and how many of us were with that loved one when they transitioned from this life to the next. On November 3rd, 2016, I received the worst phone call of my life. Holly, you need to come home now. Hospice says your mom doesn't have much time left. I was about 530 miles from my mother. I was at my house in Virginia and she was here in Michigan. Flights were sold out or so expensive we couldn't afford them. Our car was toast and my husband Brian had just been called to active duty orders with the Navy. So I rented a car, I packed up my four and seven year old children and I drove through the night alone with just them to get to my mom. I reached her side at about 5 a.m. after dropping the kids off with family. I held her hand, I prayed over her, and I sang Fire and Rain by James Taylor to her. My mother didn't know any lullabies when I was a kid, so that's what she used to sing to me. I kissed her forehead and I gave her permission to go. Friends and family were in and out all day to say goodbye. And in the late afternoon, I stepped out to the driveway to call and cancel a surgery she had scheduled for the next week. While I was on the phone, I heard my sister scream my name. I ran in and I knew the time had come. Surrounded by her husband, her daughters, and two of her sisters, my mom was ending her earthly journey. As we prayed, I felt God enter the room and I felt in my soul the minute she left with him. The nurse who was there with us pronounced her dead and I hit my knees and sobbed with my head buried in her side. In that moment, I gave thanks for the resurrection because I knew I would see her again someday. I often tell people it was both the worst and the most beautiful moment of my life. This is where we find Thomas today. He had not only lost someone he loved dearly, his friend, his teacher, and the man he gave up everything to follow. But he was there when Jesus died. He watched him draw his last breath hung on a cross. He heard his last words and watched as the life of his friend faded away. Now, just a few days later, he was being told Jesus was not dead. He watched him die. Surely we can understand how he might not have found it easy to believe that Jesus was alive. I remember every single moment from the time I got that phone call until shortly after my mother passed away. It is burned into my memory, relived in my lowest moments, and replayed in my nightmares. So now tell me, what would I have said to someone if they told me a few days later that my mother was alive? Y'all, I can guarantee you my words would have been a lot more colorful than Thomas's. 
My mother died a natural death after a decades-long illness, and every moment is imprinted in me. Now, think about Jesus' death. His friends, including Thomas, watched him be tortured for hours and die a painful, horrific death. So what was Thomas supposed to think when he was being told Jesus was not, in fact, dead? In his grief, Thomas did not believe them. How many of us would have? In his grief, Thomas almost missed the resurrection. Let me repeat that. In his grief, Thomas almost missed the resurrection. How often are we guilty of this? I can tell you right now, my friends, in a post-pandemic world, it is happening all the time. The world has gone through trauma, loss, and despair. We have faced things we never thought we would face, and our world has changed forever. And that hurts. Grieving is a natural process. It is nothing to be rushed through or ashamed of. But we need to be careful that in our grieving, we aren't missing the resurrection. We are a resurrection people, y'all. Our whole faith is based on it. So we need to open our eyes and see it. Does St. John's look the exact same way as it did in early March of 2020? No, it does not. Nothing in this world does. We've lost time, opportunities, missed out on milestones, and things that mattered. It hurts, and it is unfair. However, I am refusing to keep looking back. I am learning to acknowledge and process my grief, to honor it, name it, and to feel it without letting it consume me. I am opening my eyes and seeing the signs of resurrection everywhere in life and here at St. John's. Things don't look the same and there are things we have lost, but every day I see beauty and growth. Our camping ministry is growing by leaps and bounds. As of today, we have raised $1,260 for camp scholarships for our kids. We currently have four families and seven children and youth going to camp this summer. Every time I look around the sanctuary, I see new faces. And I see some of those new faces joining us for events and volunteering on committees, bringing us their time and their talents. We have new kids coming to Sunday school all the time and being embraced in the fold. The youth group is coming up with new service projects forming bonds and finding their voices in our community. The spirit is moving here. New friendships are being formed. New groups like our 20s and 30s and LGBTQ group are being created. Our social justice ministry is growing. We have air conditioning in the sanctuary. <laughs> new spaces to utilize together and soon a new elevator to help make sure that we are more welcoming and accessible for everyone. We have welcomed Gerardo and soon we will witness him becoming ordained as a priest and we will share in his ministry with him during the time he is ours. There is resurrection everywhere. When Jesus was resurrected, he didn't look the exact same. That is why some of his disciples had trouble recognizing him. But once they opened their eyes to really look, they could see it was still him. Church does not look the same. But as we open our eyes and look, we can see it is still church. We cannot remain so blinded by our grief. We fail to see the resurrection whether here at church or in life, death and rebirth, death and rebirth, this is the cycle in nature and in our faith lives. I am not asking you not to grieve. 
not telling you your grief isn't valid, and I'm not promising you an easy way out. I'm just asking that you see the wounds in our hands and our sides in our lives and come to believe in the resurrection of our lives as Thomas came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Thomas had lost his friend, his teacher, the man he gave up everything to follow, and his grief was tremendous. But he came to see the resurrection anyway. In the moments after my mother's death, I gave thanks for the resurrection. Thomas was grieving so deeply, <clears throat> he almost missed the resurrection. Today, I stand in a place where I have had to choose the path ahead of me. Do I give thanks for the resurrection I see around me, or do I stay buried in my grief and miss it? I have made my choice. I am asking you, St. John's, to stand in that place with me and choose a path. I am embracing resurrection, and I promise if you come with me, I'll hold your hand along the way. Amen.